Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. 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 A lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work you've done and for those of you that actually sat through, was it six hours of video of me? Did, is that, did someone just tell me that to make me feel bad or did that actually occur? <laughs> anyway, I apologize for that. And, um, and, and also, uh, very, very sincerely, I want to thank you for all the work you've done up to this point and all that you're about to do on this exhibition. You're, you're as I know you hear quite often and never enough, uh, the work you do is just immensely important to the programming and the success of exhibitions and everyone here in this institution appreciates what you do very, very much. So with, with that, uh, I thought today that I, I've got a lot of images that I could show. I could talk about those things. Um, I, I, I have just a few remarks I want to make about the exhibition in general. And then I thought it might be most productive to go directly into questions and an hopefully answers. Uh, you've also, how much time have you spent actually in the exhibition at this point? Six hours, but not enough time to look and see. We do have a lot to cover in a short period, so, okay. But I love the idea that six hours is not really enough time to look and see, and, and uh, that's, that's sort of what I'm discovering every time I walk through the exhibition, every time I see these things. Um, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, what, what is it? like as a curator to walk into an exhibition and of course when you're when you're trying to put something together um, you basically are kind of encountering objects in a singular way and it's never until you actually walk in and see everything together do you know whether the story you wanted to tell actually works with the objects that um, uh, have been brought together. And I think I had good sense of it in Paris, although that installation was not as precisely formed as what we're able to do here. And as this, ex as this installation has taken form, I truly have become more and more excited because here we can really control, to a great degree, the progression of objects and the resulting kind of resonances and interconnectedness that exists between objects and the story that they all tell, both individually and together, and also the flow. I think one of the most interesting exhibitions I've seen in recent years was at the Denver Art Museum. They had an exhibition on, uh, I think the title was Becoming Van Gogh. And what struck me about it is that with um, Without the, without the headset, without reading any labels, uh, without getting involved with any interactives, without listening to anybody, a person could really walk through that exhibition and understand what was being communicated from the works of art alone. You just had a sense of it. And hopefully that's what this exhibition is going to do. It tells the story of Plains culture over the long history over, over really several hundreds of years, going back 2,000 years in terms of the oldest piece in the exhibition. And it's through these works of art that hopefully one senses change and evolution in culture as, as these things were expressed in the arts. And you all know from your work how very closely tied culture and art uh, existed in, in uh, historical native cultures, pre-contact cultures, and to a degree up to the present day. So the exhibition itself, I think you, it was, it was organized by Musée de Quibonly in Paris. Uh, it came about when Stéphane Martin, the, the president, came to the Nelson Atkins to see the new galleries that opened the year before. And uh, we ended up spending the day together, having a long conversation, and out of that came the invitation to curate the exhibition. And th this was, it was in an interesting moment. It was right after Mark had departed and before Julian actually came. And um, 
I said, of course, I don't know if I can do this or not, but, but whatever we decide, if we're going to do this exhibition, it's got to come to Kansas City. And Stefan said, no problem. So um, things moved very rapidly after that, and then I stepped back and took some time to think about it, um, because I don't speak French and I don't read French, and I have not spent much time there. I don't know the culture, and I'm old, and I know, uh, and I know what a project like this is. I was telling somebody the other night that it's a lot like si signing on to a whaling ship in the 19th century. I mean, there's, there's, there's no stopping off at port along the way. You just sort of go as long as you can, and then you come, you come back, and. Um, I could also quote you Long John Silver, but I'll save that for later. That's good. Anyway, the exhibition opened in Paris in um, uh, April of this year. Uh, it was received wonderfully by the French media. Um, we're told that the exhibition was extremely popular, and I think everything went well. Um, we have, let me talk a little bit about the organization of this project. The, the um, well, before that, uh, Plains, Plains culture and Plains art was my first real love and interest uh, in looking at Native American art. And I've moved back and forth between that in my own work and in my work as a teacher and, and uh, actually in creating the galleries that were here where I've had to operate very much as a generalist. So the idea of possibly doing something with Plains Art was very attractive to me, but I also recognized that there have been a number of exhibitions, uh, a number of publications that have told the story of Plains culture and art very, very well. And so the first question was, how could this exhibition be different? How, what, what, what was there left to do? And the answer was in Kebron Lee's collection itself. That museum, has the oldest historical Plains Indian art in the world. From the 1700s, when Kansas City was at the heart of French America, and uh, actually we were on a bit on the outskirts of French America, which bordered the Mississippi River. And of course they claimed everything west of the Rocky Mountains, but they couldn't really control it or occupy it. But anyway, this was French, French um, territory. And the French got on very well with native peoples in general. And as a result, things started going back to France as early as 1700 or perhaps before. They went through a succession of institutions and ended up uh, most recently at Musée de Quai And I was going back and forth uh, about this. And um, anyway, at some point, Jonathan King, who I think you know, he's spoken here before. He's the former director or former um, curator of Indian art at the British Museum. He said, you know, if you can get those robes back here, you have to do this. And um, that sort of made the decision because of the nine things that are back from Kebron Lee, eight of them have not returned to North America since they were collected and they constitute an extraordinary body of works. So the idea of being able to do an exhibition that presumed to track the history of the culture seemed possible. Earlier shows, they either dealt with a particular period of time, or they told the story with a particular collection, or they focused on a particular type of art. And this seemed to be an opportunity to kind of try to cover the whole long history with a select number of objects. And that, of course, took us to loan requests and um, I was delighted that, that every institution that, that was asked to lend, every individual, if they were able to do so, with one or two exceptions, if they were able to lend the object, if it was not too fragile, they were willing to do it. And as a result, uh, this exhibition contains, I think, an unusually large number of iconic works, those that have been uh, well established in the literature, together with some things that are coming out for the first time. Uh, the Kibon Lee objects have not been shown in North America with the exception of one that came 20 years ago, and they're not shown in Paris either uh, because they have a limited amount of space and only a few things are out. So that was a great opportunity. It, 
that seemed. The strange contradiction of trying to do an exhibition over that covers a span, an unbroken continuum, a constant, a constant uh, set of changes and evolution in a culture over time in reaction to multiple forces. Um, that was really the objective on the one hand, to move this culture, to, to, to create a picture of a culture in dynamic change without break. And on the other side of it, we had to somehow uh, break that down into some kind of manageable organization. And the result was to break this exhibition into seven sections, which you will see. And each, each section has a text panel, more or less in proximity with the area that it describes and the time period that it describes. But it's rather loosely organized because we wanted to maintain the idea of art and culture flowing from one period into the next, but at the same time create some kind of organizational structure that would make it possible for a visitor to kind of understand what was going on. There are 137 works in the exhibition, uh, 58 different institutional and private lenders. Uh, key messages of the exhibition. One is continuity, of course, within the culture. Uh, breaking down the stereotype that Plains Indians lived in the late 19th century and that there was nothing much before and nothing much after. The fact is, it is an unbroken continuum. And also, as you, as you know from the history of American Indian art in this institution, we're presenting these things as, as the beautiful, complex, and sophisticated works of art that they are. They're complicated materially, conceptually. Um, many of them possess enormous expressive power, which will not take you long to see. Um, much of the work is spiritual in nature. Some of it is, is, is directly religious. Some of it is spiritual or religious by association. It's a, uh, it's a religious art, fundamentally, as most Native American art is when you get to the real base of it. And that brings us to the title, Artists of Earth and Sky. Uh, I had a lot of fun trying to figure out what the title might be, which, which um, had conversations between myself and uh, Stefan Martin, who, of course, and I don't speak French, so I would come up with these titles and we, we would talk and he would laugh and explain how, you know, the titles I was coming up with were either totally inappropriate or, uh, you know, I mean, Earth and Sky, Sky connects with Venus, Venus, correct. You know, I mean, you know, he says, you don't want to go down that line here in Paris. So, anyway. In, in Paris, the show was called The Plains Indians, Indians Des Plains, and they wanted a very simple direct title. Here, we're used to titles that, that, that are usually two-part that help define. And if you've had an opportunity to, to walk out on the plains, I mean, go out into the Flint Hills, stand yourself somewhere, and look at the horizon, which is a great circle. And then if you begin to think about what's beneath you in terms of the underworld, the nadir, you think about what's above you, the heavens. Uh, and if you think about the four directions, the four sacred directions, you've described the universe, the worldview in terms of Plains Indian cosmology. And those six points, the four directions, the above, the below, all intersect at what is thought of as the world center, the ritual center, the heart. And that's within the heart of each individual. Uh, and if you think about a nomadic culture, it's very, very appropriate. And so that, plus the fact that as you move through this exhibition, you will see so many of these works in the materials they're made from, in the imagery that they possess in the ideas that they convey are all connected with the inhabitants of this world. Uh, those that, that are powers below, powers above, those that exist on the plane of the earth that we occupy. And the references are simply innumerable. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. 
and so it seemed like it seemed like a good title after um, uh, a certain bit of thrashing around. Someone said to me once, he says, you know, like titles for exhibitions are like titles for rock bands. All the, all the best ones are taken. <laughs> and, um, and so there was some of that, but we were very pleased with what we, what we ended up with. Another major theme of this exhibition is the fact that these objects were all created by individuals or in collaboration by individuals. Uh, they didn't, as Nancy Blumberg at the Denver Art Museum was quoted saying, they didn't just sort of bubble up out of culture. When I first started reading in the literature, you had the idea that basically the art was sort of, it, there, there wasn't art, it was material culture, and it was produced by both men and women, and then somebody got the idea that because there's no word for art in native languages that they certainly must not have had art. Um, and of course, none of that is true. Uh, native cultures are like any other art producing culture. And that is that certain individuals were enormously talented, inspired, and motivated to produce works that were recognized within their communities. Uh, these people were honored for their abilities and for their contribution to the culture. Basically in Indian art, all of, the most, all of the most profound values, all of the most profound ideas are conveyed through the art, just as they are in conventional Euro-American painting and sculpture. Only these things are functional. And that idea that these functional things, um, well, the idea that these were functional was a great impediment to, I think, Euro-Americans really treating this material seriously. Uh, it was exotic, certainly, and it was interesting, and a lot of it was collected, but nobody much thought about who was making it. Nobody recorded the artist's names, pretty much. Um, it, was simply, it was simply acquired as a representation of culture, and in its earliest presentations, it was presented as such. And it's only been in the 20th century that that um, scholarship and Native American oral tradition has, has begun to weigh in, and we are discovering names as we move through different projects. Sometimes just even who an object, or wh what am I trying to say, um, the association of an object to a particular person, or better yet, the person or people that made it. When I say people, you'll notice going through the show, um, the labels might say Lakota artist one time, singular, Lak Lakota artist plural at another time. And this is because traditionally the creation of art was determined by gender, um, just as the responsibilities of life were determined by gender. So women produced certain forms of art, men traditionally produced other forms of art. But there are many forms that had to have been done collaboratively. For instance, um, if you look at a war shirt, an early war shirt, the exhibition, you'll see the tanned hides of which it's made, undoubtedly done by a woman. You will see porcupine quill disc in the center and the, of the chest and the back created by a woman. You will see beadwork embroidery created by a woman. And then you think about the construction of the shirt, the painting of the shirt, which was probably done by a man, the actual construction, which might have occurred within a ritual procedure, the attachment of the individual hair locks, which may have been done by men. In other words, they're collaborative works. And um, so some of the things that we think of as being made by women exclusively or men exclusively, we really question that at this point. When you have the time to look at the text panels, you will see that uh, they're constructed in what might be an unusual way. Uh, one thing that I was very keen on in the publication initially, and then in the text panels, was the presence of native voice. And the text panels are broken down into two, three, or four different voices. I always come at the end as the curator of the exhibition. Uh, I comment on the art during a particular period of time. 
there's a historian, Colin Galloway, who is an eminent historian from Dartmouth who um, uh, wrote an extraordinary book called One Vast Winter Count that I know I've recommended before. Uh, he was one of the principal essayists of the book and he discusses these different periods from his perspective. And then two eminent Native American scholars, Arthur Amiot and Emma Hansen, uh, respectively Lakota and Pawnee, they also have contributed to these. And we hoped in these text panels to really present the idea of a dialogue between many voices, not differing perspectives, but rather a dialogue of people looking at the same period of time and the same culture and the same art. And um, so that was important. In the catalog of the 30 authors, I believe seven of them are Native American. Uh, that was important. And then the final thing are the videos that exist in the installation. Uh, it, it, um, it seemed to do an exhibition like this with the living artists that we have and to not record them talking about their work was a missed opportunity. So through Bruce Hartman actually, we learned of a Navajo videographer who lives in Santa Fe uh, Dylan McLaughlin, he's a young man, 24 years old, and we saw, he did a video for, for Bruce's show, Christina McCorse, and I was taken with it, and we tracked him down and asked if he would be interested in making videos of the artists in this exhibition. He was, he was, we sent him around the country, he spent a day with people, he interviewed them, and he came back with an extraordinary group of interviews that last about two to three minutes. And I was originally thinking that we would put them on our website, we would, um, uh, I didn't know what we'd do with them, but we'd have them. And at a certain point, as I watched those and listened to them, I thought this is, this is what people should be hearing in the contemporary gallery. And I, I, I'm now, I'm of an old school. I, I don't like noise in, in galleries. Um, I, I don't, um, anyway, I, 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 don't, I don't like distraction. That's, my, that's one of my personal weaknesses, perhaps. But, um, so I didn't want anything until I saw those videos, and then I thought they have got to be out. The people are talking not about, um, their own individual works so much. Because if they were, that would be less functional, I think. Instead, all of them are really talking about what it means to be a Native American artist in today's society in the United States. And uh, you don't even need to be watching the video. You can simply listen to what they have to say in relation to the objects that are in that particular section of the gallery. and. Um, um, so I turned Judy Koch on her head and said, I want videos in the gallery. And um, she just looked at me um, because I, uh, of course, have opposed those things. Anyway, we, we decided to move in that direction and I'm, I'm very happy with them. So have you, have you had an opportunity to watch those, see them? No. Okay, they're on YouTube, if you do that sort of thing. You know. uh, okay. All right, um, I, think, I think that's all I really want to cover. So Helen tells me that, that from going through the galleries and looking at things, you have a lot of questions. And um, so shall we just, I can go on and talk. About the time I was leaving the university, uh, no, I had a colleague who came about the same time I did. And he said, you know, when I first started teaching, I worked for three hours to speak intelligently for 20 minutes. And now that I've been teaching for 30 years, I can talk for three hours with no preparation or knowledge whatsoever about any subject you want. So, anyway, so what, what questions do you have? Yes.
Uh, the question was, what kind of restrictions apply to feathers moving in and out of this country? Um, and materials and all of that. Well, you go straight to one of the first traumatic instances of this exhibition. Um, the French told me there would be no problem bringing eagle feathers into the country, and I was stupid enough not to check with Fish and Wildlife, trusted them, and um, I don't know, about a, a late into the process, we learned that eagle feathers cannot leave the United States under any circumstances, simply cannot be done. And so uh, what I did was scramble to find substitutions in Paris, in European, or in European collections, and substituted those things. So the first full exhibition is being shown here. Um, we did okay in Paris, but in some cases, there were simply not comparable objects that could be found. Um, things can, eagle feathers can come from anywhere and enter the United States and leave, uh, so long as they originate somewhere else. So, yes. The question is, can I talk about uh, the symbolism and imagery of the buffalo robes? And maybe, maybe I would defer that until we're down in the gallery and we're standing, what? Helen has a microphone. <laughs> Helen has a microphone. So, uh, but, but very, it, let, let's wait. It would be easier if we're standing right in front of them. Good. What? Well, no, because this is a select group of images. And I can go through some, but no, it would be better to wait. Yes. East. Are they, are they just direction, north, south, east, west, or is it sky, earth, earth? No, it's, it's the four directions on the horizontal plane of the earth. So east, south, west, north. And each of those directions is associated with a distinct power, a distinct color. Um, but but each, is, each is associated with, with a... I'll say a distinct complex of sacred powers. And the four directions figure strongly into the um, uh, ceremonialism and many of the rituals of Plains peoples. Yes? Um, oh. Well, I, I, think it, I think it begins with celestial bodies. And, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how, okay, north, south, east, west are European concepts. Uh, and how do they equate with Plains Indian uh, culture? I, I, I think probably not. I, I don't think they're European concepts. I think they're universal concepts. And they begin with the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. and the seasons, and uh, there, there are a number of references that orient people, and also these people lived on the land. And so the idea, and each of the directions, of course, each tribe uh, within their own language had their own name, but directionality, if that's a word, was very, very important. And also uh, uh, winds were associated with four directions, uh, there, there were many things connected with it. Yes. Yes. There were a couple of materials that we were curious about. The first was pony beads, mm -hmm. as opposed to the layer glass beads, mm -hmm. and the other was German silver. Okay. Uh, the question is beads. How do you differentiate the different types? There are two basic types, three. Actually, it kind of breaks down into three, but the earliest beads were called pony beads because they came to the plains 
on the pack horses of itinerant traders that would travel from village to village. And these are large. They can be up to an eighth of an inch in diameter. They're primarily blue, white, and black. And Lewis and Clark, other early explorers onto the plains said, you know, to native peoples, blue beads are equivalent to our gold and white beads are equivalent to our silver. They represented a tremendous amount of wealth through trade and uh, trading in furs primarily to uh, acquire Euro-American materials and pony beads were the first class beads that were used in embroidery. There's a smaller version of the pony bead, which a lot of people still call pony beads, and it's called real bead, R-E-A-L. But that, those beads are still larger than the seed bead, which is the tiniest. And if you want to see the most remarkable example of seed bead embroidery, it's the yellow Lakota dress. Uh, the, the yellow beaded yoke on the Lakota dress. It's amazing. And these are tiny, tiny beads uh, that basically started to replace pony beads in the 1850s and had really replaced them by 1865, 18, by, the, by the 1860s. It happened pretty rapidly. And the great attraction, I think, was that with smaller beads, you could create more intricate designs and also the palette expanded greatly. The palette of beads expanded greatly. Yes? The ceremonial um, pole. The ceremonial bowl. Yes. And there was a reference there to gluttony. Yes. Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, the, the question, no, there, there's a, a, a magnificent bowl from um, uh, Detroit Institute of Art, and we can all thank Nee for making sure the loan came through. Um, it's, it's a bowl with, with a head that rises up from the rim, and that, that uh, creature is called Ia, the glutton, and it's basically a in Dakota myth and Nakota myth, it's a, uh, a kind of an ogre, kind of a voracious creature that tries to devour everything in its sight. And um, uh, so this, this is a mythic creature and the Dakota and the Middle Sioux, the Yankton and Yanktonne particularly, uh, had religious feasts um, that honored this spirit, and they were called eat-all feasts. And um, you were given vast quantities of food, and if you didn't consume it all, you owed the host a gift. And I mean, these are some of the some of the things just in the um, um, the ritual itself. But the the basis of the ceremony, I'm sure, was to honor that spirit and the powers that it also provided to the people. Uh, in the woodlands, all religious ceremonies, or nearly all of them, involve uh, partaking of consecrated food. And beautiful wooden bowls were created to hold that food. And uh, this tradition moved into the plains, uh, beginning with the Eastern Plains people and then out onto the prairies. It didn't go much beyond that. But the ceremonies that also had, in a sense, their origins in the Western Great Lakes woodlands uh, came out and influenced the Eastern Plains people as well. So on the map, when you see a sharp division between the woodlands and the plains, keep in mind that it's permeable. It moves back and forth, uh, both in terms of artistic ideas uh, cultural and religious concepts and uh, ways of looking at the world. Yes?
Yeah, the, the question was, could I talk about the star chart and the terms of wrapping and unwrapping and kind of what that means in relation to that? Um, I included that object in, in the book. Um, I wanted it, of course, in the exhibition because I think it's an extraordinary thing and I couldn't get it. The Field Museum would not lend it. And the explanation that they provided seemed to give opportunity to really uh, educate uh, a non-Indian audience about uh, the fact that many, many museums hold sacred objects in their collections that were collected mostly in the 19th century, sometimes later. And um, <clears throat> this was an opportunity to talk about that. The star chart was part of a sacred Pawnee bundle. These, these bundles are assemblage, assemblages. A bundle is an assemblage of materials that embodies the sacred power of a vision that came to an individual or a group. And the material objects, the material, the physical manifestation of sacred power is kept in a, in a bundle that is wrapped sometimes in many layers of deer hide originally. Usually it was deer hide. And the bundle was part of the ceremonies that were performed that engaged and uh, made possible the powers residing in the bundle. In other words, the, the bundle was the, the point of connection between the sacred powers and those here on earth who were blessed with those sacred powers. But the bundle and its ritual, and by that I mean the songs that were associated with it, the ritual acts, sometimes the painting of individuals, all of these things that, con that constitute the ritual were connected with the opening of the bundle. And objects were sometimes laid out um, to be seen and honored. Sometimes they were used in certain ways within the ceremony. Uh, sometimes this was done on an annual or um, semi-annual basis. Sometimes it depended on the nature of the bundle itself. There were many, many, many different kinds of bundles. And uh, so does that, let me stop here. Does that make sense to you in terms of talking about a bundle? This star chart was part of the big black meteorite bundle of the Pawnee. It was a great bundle. I mean, large and also very, very powerful. And uh, for many years, it was on display in the Field Museum. I grew up looking at that, that amazing painting. I asked for it for the exhibition and the former curator, uh, uh, Jonathan wrote back and said, you know, I, we, we can't lend it. It's wrapped, it's, it's back in its bundle. And it can never be unwrapped again unless the Pawnee choose to do it. What occurred was at the turn of the century, the great wealth of Pawnee ceremonial material, religious material, was collected by the Field Museum. Much of it went on display. Um, in a couple of decades ago, it was taken off display. It resides in the Field Museum with the institution of the NAGPRA law, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. The Pawnee could legally have asked for it back. Instead, they chose to leave it in the Field Museum. Two reasons for this. Um, I'm sure that there were people in the Pawnee community that thought, you know, the field has cared for this material all these years. It's in, it's in perfect storage. If anyone's going to preserve this in the future, for the future, it will be a museum like the field. And then there were others, I'm certain, within the community that felt we've lost the ability to access these bundles. They still hold tremendous power. They're dangerous. We don't want them back in the community. We don't know how to handle them. And uh, we, we, don't, we, want, we don't want them back. And so, uh, however it occurred, the Pawnee asked the Field Museum to retain possession of the sacred objects. And Jonathan Haas, the curator, was asked to rewrap the bundles. 
and uh, a Pawnee uh, doctor, I'm sure, came and instructed him, as he says in the book, uh, in the proper frame of mind, the proper procedure. I'm sure it was not followed in the way that it, it, it should have been. I, I'm, I would almost assure you that that information has been lost, but they did the best they could. They wrapped these, they wrapped these objects back together. They tied them up. And as he says, uh, they were not wrapped according to conservation standards. They were, they were wrapped according to, to um, the will of the Pawnee people. They were, they were wrapped according to what made sense in terms of the bundle. In other words, there was no tissue paper in between things. It was all wrapped up. And he basically said, we cannot, we cannot unwrap these for display. And uh, if the Pawnee ever want them back, they can have them. They can come to the field and pray over them if they choose. Uh, but that's the situation. And I thought this was a, just a nice opportunity to kind of talk about that dynamic because some of his own colleagues said, if we can't show this stuff, what are we doing keeping it? It's taking up storage space, et cetera. And he proposed that uh, there are, there are evolving uh, negotiations, evolving relationships between native peoples and communities. It's part of the ongoing change that this exhibition is about. And we have some things in our own collection that uh, will probably never be put on view. There's one object in particular, it's a sacred bundle. Uh, we don't know for sure where it comes from. We think we might. Um, the traditional people would say, we don't want this back. We've lost the ability to access it. We no longer, we don't know the songs. We don't know the ritual. This thing is dangerous. Let it lie. Just, you know, treat it with respect. Keep it there. And, um, you know, if, if we knew the exact tribe, it might be that some people would come in and pray over it, drop tobacco. Uh, this is true with the great Omaha material that was collected by the Peabody Harvard Museum that was repatriated uh, back to um, one of the museums, I think it's the Missouri Historical Museum, Missouri, the Nebraska State Historical Museum. They have a special room for the, the Omaha sacred material. Um, half the Omaha people don't want it back, the other half come to Lincoln, Nebraska to engage it. So it's a long answer, but it's kind of a fascinating subject. Yes? Is there a difference between shaman and medicine man? Are they interchangeable? And do women have any powers that relate to the medicine man? Because I think that that's the other thing that I think is interesting. So the question is, are, are shamans and uh, medicine men uh, essentially, those terms interchangeable, and do women are women also regarded as having sacred power uh, along with the men? And um, the answer is yes. I think those terms are interchangeable. Sometimes the word doctor is used. Sometimes priest is used. Uh, but it's someone who has the power to. Um, provide spiritual help and understands rituals and. Um, those kinds of procedures. Uh, the qualifications may vary from tribe to tribe and the type of medicine man or medicine woman, uh, but um, they're all kind of interchangeable. Women, um, women were every bit men's equal in terms of the acquisition and the exercise of sacred power. And so in many, many ceremonials, there are special positions, special roles for women. Um, women also have their own societies, their own religious societies, uh, just as men do. But in the great tribal ceremonies like the Sundance, there, um, there are very important roles for women. Many, among many peoples, women were regarded equally as men as great healers. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was uh, the, the idea that the men did everything and the women didn't get to do anything is not at all true. They're very, very equal partnerships and well-defined. Yes?
Which, which thing are you talking about in the exhibition? What it's can you? Bundle or it's in upstairs, certainly in the southwest. We have a bundle that was created for an anthropologist studying the rituals of the Indian people. And it's done by an Indian artist. Is that an issue if it's done for an anthropologist and outsider? Is that sensitive in any way? Yeah, I think you're talking about the turtle. The turtle, yeah, it's a Meskwaki object. It was done in Iowa. So the question is, um, numbers of questions. Uh, the things that were commissioned by anthropologists, how were they viewed by native peoples? Uh, was it controversial? Um, what are the issues around all of that? Um, when most of that activity was occurring, the cultures were in, in the throes of enormous change. There was a great deal of loss that was occurring. Um, Plains cultures were being impacted by missionaries, anthropologists, uh, you know, educational people, you know, teachers that wanted to um, create school. Basically, there was a huge, huge force to eradicate native culture, to get rid of language, religion, dress, I mean, all of those things, and basically acculturate native peoples uh, into the mainstream American society. society. And this was, this was maybe at its most intense level at the end of the 19th century. And there were also native peoples that recognized that a lot of things were being lost within their own communities and within their own cultures. And it, it would be easy to say that that native peoples were losing everything and people from the outside came in and took everything they could. But I think it was a lot more complicated than that. Um, some native peoples were adopting uh, Christianity at the same time they were holding their native beliefs and traditions. And that was the beginning of, in a sense, living in two worlds. Uh, there were There were artists that produced things for anthropologists uh, it, you know, there were, there were anthropologists that were moving into, I mean, basically, the anthropologists, just like the missionaries, kind of cut aside territories to move into. And uh, among the Kiowa, it was James Mooney, and he spent a lot of time with the Kiowa, and he recorded a lot of incredibly valuable information that is important to the Kiowas themselves today. But he was, uh, he was interested in mythology, he was interested in, in ceremonialism, he was interested in the Sundance, and he was, um, he was commissioning artists to produce things, to record things that had been lost. There's a miniature teepee upstairs, which belonged to a man named Never Got Shot. And these teepees descended through families, and they were powerful. And oh, you, you, you couldn't just sort of paint your teepee because you liked that person's design. It was, uh, these were held by the families. But the original buffalo hide teepee had been lost, but it of course was still there in the minds of, uh, and the oral traditions of the Kiowas of that generation. And Mooney, Mooney commissioned a number of Kiowa artists to start reproducing all the painted teepees that could be remembered within the history of the tribe. And as a result, we have quite a record of what occurred there. And I, just a funny thing, recently I was looking at a collection of ledger drawings, Plains Indian drawings done in the 1870s, and in the camp was that teepee that, that is, is replicated in the miniature up in the gallery. It was, it was there at that time in the 1870s, and sometime during the close of the Indian Wars and the early reservation life, it was lost, but it then was recovered. Uh, the turtle is a different matter. That was, um, uh, that, was, that was created up in Iowa. There was a carver who was, quote, an informant for the... Um, the anthropologist that was working there, the anthropologist was trying to record myths and sacred bundle information 
and uh, of course the Meskwaki would not show anyone their sacred bundles. They still had them, by the way, and they still do. Um, the Sauk people lost all their bundles. They moved to Oklahoma. The, Iowa, the Meskwaki managed to stay in Iowa and retain many of their sacred bundles. And um, so what he did was he carved replicas of the objects that were in the bundles. He made them pretty much uniformly twice as big as the real ones are. And, um, and they're all made of wood. They're all made of walnut. And I've tracked about six of them around. But one of the most interesting and thrilling moments was when I was doing my work with the Meskwaki people and I was with uh, the leader of the Fox clan who is um, um, in a sense responsible for the religion of the tribe. And I showed him a photograph of the wooden buffalo that's in the Museum of the American Indian. And you know, I grew up reading what it said. It said this is a sacred object. It's used in the ceremonies of buffalo hunting and so forth and so on. And it's a beautiful carving amazing thing. And when I was teaching art history, I would always cite it and talk about it as being, uh, you know, collected from a bundle and so forth and so on. And um, I showed the picture to um, my friend and he looked at it and I said, what do you think of this? And he looked at it a long time and he said, it's really pretty good. And I said, yeah, it's, it's a great work of art. He said, well, yeah. And he said, but it's not real. And I said, what do you mean it's not real? He said, the real one is still with us. And I said, what? And I said, just like this, it's, it's, it's a wooden buffalo? And he said, yes, except ours is stone. And, uh, and the spots on the joints are green instead of red. And I said, well, what about this? He said, my grandfather carved it. And what a revelation. Um, changed, changed my scholarship right there. Uh, you know, so. But yeah, it was the, at the turn of the century, the world of Plains Indians was extremely complex. Many forces at work, many connections that were being made between non-Indians and Plains Indians. It wasn't all bad. Um, and an exchange of ideas, exchange of material goods, um, you know, people going off to boarding school. One of the most moving things I read during the course of my research was a letter that um, a Northern Plains man, I can't remember his tribe, had sent to, the Smith, sent to the American Museum of Natural History. And he said, I'm sending you my sacred things. He said, you know, everything's changing here. The young people don't understand this stuff. When you're my age, you say that about old young people anyway, you know. Uh, but they, they don't understand, we're losing everything. Uh, these things are powerful, I can no longer use them. I'll be gone soon, and so I'm sending them to, to this great museum, which I'm told is a stone lodge that will never burn down or can be blown down by the wind, and that these things will be kept forever. So there was that going on. And there were also anthropologists who were bulldozing their way into kivas in the Southwest where they shouldn't have been, taking pictures. Or, I mean, so it's a mix. There were a great, uh, uh, you know, I grew up seeing a set of basically altars in the Field Museum. There were replicas of altars that had been, that, that served a purpose among the Hopi. Uh, for certain rituals, and I'd always thought they were the real thing, and subsequently learned later they were all pretty much reproductions uh, that had been based on photographs taken by the anthropologist. And they were there for, you know, a hundred years until the field did a exhibition and they brought in some Hopi advisors who said, you know, you people really shouldn't be showing this stuff. and. Um, and, and here was a fascinating thing. This guy said, you shouldn't be showing this. This is about the bean ceremony, and this is about Niman Kachina, and this is about the snake antelope ceremony. You shouldn't be showing those. Uh, you know, I, I would respectfully ask that they be removed. They shouldn't be seen on the outside. 
and the field removed them. But then the, the, the curator said, well, wait a minute, what about this Maru society, this woman's society altar? And the man said, I have no idea, I don't know anything about that, that's the prerogative of women. Which I thought was the most telling example of the traditional Native American idea that um, people have the right to certain bodies of knowledge and other people do not. And of course, this is in direct collision with the ideals of mainstream Euro-American thought where it's believed that you can, anything that you can learn should be available to you and accessible. So we're still kind of reconciling and negotiating those two world views in exhibitions like this. Yes. Uh, they were from, the, I think the earliest were from Venice. I'm sorry, where did the beads come from? Were they Czechoslovakian? And I believe the first beads were from Venice, and then Czechoslovakia got into the act, I think later into, into the 19th century. Yes. Well, the Sundance is, uh, it's an annual ceremony. It's the great annual ceremony of world and cultural renewal. And it was for the renewal of the buffalo, the renewal of the people, the renewal of the land, the renewal of the universe. It was performed on an annual basis by nearly all Plains Indian tribes. Now, it took different forms among the different tribes, but it was, it was performed almost universally. I believe the Comanche were the only people that did not have an annual Sundance. And it, um, uh, it, as I say, it took different forms, being a four to eight day ritual. Um, there were a lot of attendant activities in the Sundance. In other words, the ceremony, the great ceremony was going on, but there were also smaller, it was a time of coming together with the entire tribe. During the winter, the peoples had to break into smaller groups and uh, to, su to support themselves through the winter. But in the summer, when the grass was high and the horses were fat and there were a lot of buffalo, and, and I'm talking about the 19th century, um, peoples would come together for the Sundance and there would be naming ceremonies and society ceremonies and courtship and a lot of gift giving and a lot of renewal of acquaintances and friendships. And so it was a great, great communal time to be together as well as the celebration of this great life renewing ceremony. When the government outlawed the Sundance, native peoples pretty much moved their ceremony off into the hills away from the agency and transferred all of the other aspects of that great gathering time to the 4th of July. And they became a great 4th of July celebration. And with it, you have a lot of American flags embroidered on things done for the 4th of July that would be uh, given away as gifts and that sort of thing. It's two. Let me see what I've got here. Yes. No, the 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 patriotic they were part of the Fourth of July celebrations, and they were I think they commemorated that particular time of year, is what it was mostly about, and that particular time of being together. Um, it was also, it was, a, a, I think, a symbol of patriotism as well. Um, there, were, there were numbers of uh, Native American men that were employed by the government agencies and uh, the tribal police and scouts and all of that sort of thing, and uh, the symbol was appropriated. So, yes.
Yes. Well, the question is, as you go through the labels, go through the objects, you see that some were made by, an, by named artists and other things were made for uh, important people. And basically, if we know the name of the artist or artists, we indicate that. And if we happen to know that a certain object was associated with someone of real importance, like Red Cloud, we've indicated that. And that's, that's basically the separation. Does that get to what you're... Yes. 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 Well, I think um, I can't expand on it. The question is, there are going to be tours given for some Kickapoo school children, and the concern is that they not be in the same room with burial objects, objects that were associated with a burial. And we have two pieces in the exhibition that were taken from burial mounds, and it's, it's the two pipes the moment you enter the exhibition. And um, all I can say is within the, I believe that many of these students are part of the drum religion. And it is part of their doctrine that they should not be around things that came from burials. And that, that concern or that belief may extend even beyond the Kickapoo. There are varying degrees of sensitivity. The question is, would they be afraid, afraid that harm could come to them? I can't answer. I don't know. I don't know what the concern is exactly or how, how the concern would manifest itself. Um, there are, I mean, within my experience, there are um, sometimes people don't want to be in the same room with something that's regarded as powerful. They don't want to be in the same room with something that has come from a burial. Um, I mean, I, I witnessed both of those things. Uh, and whether it's personal belief, tribal tradition, you know, you don't ask. Um, um, Friday evening, we conducted a very, very traditional blessing. And the man conducting the blessing was Southern Arapaho. And he came with a friend um, who was a Dine, a Navajo, and she chose not to be in the blessing. And I think it's because she, these are, it's a different religion, different, different system, and uh, she regarded herself as not a part of that. But I, you know, but maybe she just didn't want, I don't know. So, yeah. Yes. The, the best thing I can say about that is, is read the entry written by the Pawnee scholar Emma Hansen on the ghost dance dress. But, but the short answer is that um, the ghost dance was a religious movement, a movement of resistance that emerged in the late 1880s. It took, it, it found a place in the religious belief of certain Plains cultures, not others. For instance, it was very, very strong among the Southern Arapaho, but it was not strong among the Southern Cheyenne who had been their allies for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and it basically, it basically was based on the idea that if the ceremony was performed, the, the ghost dance was performed, that the old life would return. The buffalo would come back, relatives that had been lost would be returned, uh, Euro-Americans would disappear, and the old way of life would be restored. And the Sundance, uh, I'll say, played out 
in different ways among different groups. In the Southern Plains, the ghost dance continued after the massacre at Wounded Knee, but with the Lakota and the Northern Plains and uh, the terrible massacre there at Wounded Knee, that ended the ghost dance in the Northern Plains. Yes? The morning, was it what? Uh, well, the morning star is, is sometimes the same beings, the same objects can possess more than one meaning or connotation. Uh, when I think of the morning star, I think of um, um, male power and the, um, uh, and, and the warrior, basically, the warrior complex. But it can also hold other meanings. And with the ghost dance, particularly among the southern Arapaho, the certain traditional symbols were reinvested with new meanings sometimes. So it's, you, you gotta really get into it. I'll say one other thing about symbolism in the exhibition. Um, one of the things that, I think one of the stereotypes is that uh, American Indian art is symbolic and you can read it. And you, you really can't because sometimes the same motifs represent different things and sometimes different motifs represent the same thing. For instance, let's just say a Maltese cross. In one context, it might represent the morning star. In another context, it might represent the four directions. Conversely, the Maltese cross might represent the morning star and a four-pointed star might represent the morning star. So you basically need to have talked to the artist or it has to be um, a form or symbol that within a certain context has been talked about enough that you know you're accurate in, in uh, describing it as such. Should we head to the gallery? Anything else? What? No, I was just seeing the robes that, um, to see if I could return to the robes and make sense out of the question, but I don't think I can. <laughs> so let's head down. <laughs>